Thank you. Uh, Brene Brown, uh, who, g who gave one of the most beloved TED Talks a few years ago, says that stories are data with a soul. And so what I'm going to share with you today is some data with a soul. Um, the stitches together a lot of what you've heard around why um, everything that's happening today and around the world forms sort of, uh, in a way quietly what has become a global movement um, that I call the World's Bank and why citizen lending is essentially uh, disrupting, upending, reshaping uh, old uh, traditional banking. Teresa Goins is uh, essentially fighting poverty and crime one bowl of peanut butter stew at a time. She lives in San Francisco. She was a former corrections officer. She worked with gang youth and, uh, uh, and noticed that as soon as they got out of juvenile hall that they would go back and never leak back to the gangs. And her insight about that was that until they had jobs and skills and community, they would keep going back to the gangs. So she quit her job, started a 1940 suburb club in the most crime-ridden, dangerous part of San Francisco, an area called Hunters Point Bayview. And she had this idea to train them, to employ them, and have them run the supper club. But she couldn't get loans. Um, she couldn't get a loan from a bank because owning a restaurant is risky, and if you don't have restaurant experience, even more so. And so she posted her loan on Kiva. And within days, her loan had been fully funded. And within less than a year, she had repaid that loan. She moved the restaurant from her apartment to a real space. And today, she employs 25 people a year who go on into the world with jobs. They don't rejoin the gangs. And she has goals of creating these old school cafes all over the country. Now, people like Teresa are the lifeblood of the economy in the US. Um, they represent 65% of new jobs come from small businesses. In the UK, um, I believe it's about half. 50% of all private sector jobs are small, small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, and yet, and that's true all over the world, they are the lifeblood of the economy. Now, what is ironic is that uh, in the United States, uh, where they, they are very much the fabric of our, the economy. Eight out of 10 loans are rejected. Uh, small business loans are rejected. Um, globally, it's a far worse problem where you have hot, half the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. That's billions of people, who most of them are micro entrepreneurs, don't have access to capital. They don't have access to a bank, anything that looks like the kind of infrastructure that we take for granted. And so what this has really led to is that we have a global opportunity crisis that, that while talent is universal, opportunity is not, even in the United States, which is famed for being the land of opportunity. These are problems that are very uh, deeply important to me because they're also deeply personal. Um, in addition to the things you heard about my background, I am also an Egyptian immigrant. I am immigrated to the United States as a child, and I'm a survivor of war. And the experiences that I had, uh, the, the injustice that I experienced as a child um, that I witnessed, instilled in me a deep sense of wanting to bring justice to the world. And my definition of justice is in the form of fair access, because what I saw happen with my family was we couldn't get access to the kinds of resources we needed to, to live a stable life. My parents, who were educated and well, uh, very resourceful, uh, could not provide to us for us in a stable way. Um, living in a war-torn war country and seeing the, the most some of the most talented people that I've met in my life struggle, and how that shapes not only your physical reality, but your psychic reality and how that shapes your sense of identity and how it chips away at your dignity, the way it chipped away at my family's dignity. And so fair access has really become the lens through which I view the world in terms of justice. I came to Silicon Valley about 20 something years ago with little more than a dream of creating a more just world using technology. I, I've see, I saw technology as the most democratizing force that the, in the history of humankind. It has 
If you look at this picture of the internet, it has connected us in a, at a scale um, far beyond anything. Virtually every human being in the planet can access the body's, world's body of information. Virtually every human being on the planet can be connected to every other human being. And when you see the internet like this, you realize it is one large organism in which we are all nodes. And it reminds us of how interconnected we are. We often talk about the dehumanizing impact of technology, but it's also very humanizing because it is, it's giving us experience of things that we thought were just local can now happen globally. And what is happening globally feels very local. And it's reminding us that we're actually all entrepreneurs. We're all artists. We're all writers. We're all artisans. The, 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 the tools of technology are rehumanizing the way that we work. And as Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who was the inspiration for Kiva, says, is we're all entrepreneurs. We've just forgotten that instinct when the Industrial Revolution came along and forced us to be highly specialized labor. And now technology is unleashing that, that, that part of us. Kiva began with one entrepreneur, Elizabeth Amala. She was a fishmonger in Uganda, single mother of five, and she sold fish by the roadside. And she dreamed of being able to take the bus to Lake Victoria, which was hours away, so that she could buy larger quantities of fish, cut out the middleman, increase the profits of her fishing, uh, her, her business. But she couldn't afford the money to do that. One loan and one bus ride and one refrigerator that was crowdfunded by five people. She, was, she began to increase the, the scale of her business. She increased her profits. And she began sending her children to school. I think of Elizabeth as the godmother of crowdfunding. This is back in 2005, before the word crowdfunding had been coined. And from, from Elizabeth, I'll show you a video, that kind of a, a time-lapse video that you'll see of what happened over uh, the next six years. Um, and this is uh, data um, with a soul and a lot of points. Each point is a loan going um, from an individual to another individual around the world. In its first year, Kiva did 3,000 loans. In 2006, things started to pick up a little bit. See the world's lighting up at five million in loans in 2007. The green loans are agriculture loans. Fifty million in loans in two thousand and eight. We began doing education and health loans in two thousand nine. Topped a hundred million in loans in two thousand and nine. Those are all the borrowers. Top 200 million in 2011. And the, t the types of borrowers um, run the gamut from these young women who were rescued from sex trafficking in Cambodia have started a sewing cooperative, to green business loans, solar businesses in New Orleans. We seek out the riskiest parts of the world where money doesn't flow. And today, we've facilitated 
over $700 million in loans. That's 1.3 million people from every corner of the world, over 190 countries, have funded entrepreneurs, 1.6 million entrepreneurs, across 86 countries. 98% of those loans have been repaid in full. 80% of the borrowers are women. And we'll reach a billion in the next couple of years. The largest loan has been $100,000, which created 300 jobs in Haiti, in rural Haiti, uh, an eco-luxury brand called Creole Essence. And somewhere along the way, Kiva became the largest funder in post-conflict Africa. After the A groups uh, leave after a conflict, there's a, there's a devastated region with no resources and, 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 and nothing really to rebuild from. Um, one of the fascinating facts about this is, is every one of the 1.3 uh, million lenders uh, on Kiva have made a loan in sub-Saharan Africa. And it speaks to the, the collective uh, interest and connection that people have regardless of time and, and space and distance. Erastus Kamani is someone I met a few years ago in, in uh, Moragua, Kenya, hours away down a dirt road from the nearest town in a, in a hill town settlement that, that doesn't have indoor plumbing, much less indoor banking. And Erastus is a 73-year-old retired school teacher turned entrepreneur. And he explained to me, he only speaks Swahili, explained to me through a translator that he had, how he had applied for his Kiva loan, been repaid, applied for uh, been paid the loan, repaid it, applied for a second loan, repaid the second loan, and had been in contact through SMS with the 23 lenders from around the world that had, had, had loaned, loaned his, made his loan to him, and how he, that had tripled the size of his business, allowed him to relocate, and had changed his life. And meeting Erastus made me realize that there's no reason why we can't reach the next billion entrepreneurs through the mobile phone and all the technologies that are being uh, innovated and many of which you've heard of today. And it really, what it really speaks to is that more than the fact that Kiva works, works at scale, is that it's no longer unique, that it's given birth to this global marketplace of 1,400, 1,500, as soon as the number is, is stated, it's outdated crowdfunding marketplaces around the world, led by the likes of Zopa and Lending Club and Kickstarter, et cetera. And what we have is, 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 is opposed to the World Bank, which is a top-down mechanism that funds institutions, the World's Bank is a bottoms-up, nimble, person-to-person -person network that funds and gets money into the hands of entrepreneurs where they need it the most. The power of the wisdom of crowds is about the fact that people can qualify and connect and vote with their dollars in a way that no amount of loan officers ever could. It's character-based lending as opposed to collateral or credit-based lending. And time and time again, what we see is this is a crucially equitable system by the people for the people where when people know that it's, it's people lending to them, that, that commitment, that motivation to repay the loan far exceeds the, the institutional obligation that comes with bank lending, and one of the, one of the major reasons for the, the high repayment rate at 98%. In, in, this, in essence, what crowdfunding is doing is rehumanizing banking, um, perhaps best memorialized by uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know how, how popular It's a Wonderful Life is in in the, the UK, but it's, uh, it's the most, pro probably the most beloved film in the United States, uh, where the community banker, uh, George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart, uh, is, prevails over the, the big town bank uh, because he is making loans based on character and, 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 and up uplifting the community. And in a way, what, what crowdfunding is doing is, is allows all of us to become George Bailey, and it rehumanizes banking on, on a person-to-person -person basis uh, in a way that creates trust, uh, that, that is empowering, and fundamentally allows us to be a part of each other's stories. But ultimately, 
there's a new class of capital that this is enabling, connected capital, that has some unique characteristics. It's patient, it's risk-seeking rather than risk-aversive. It is accountable, it's transparent. More broadly, it's allowing us to bring business to all of humanity and humanity into the way that we do business. Thank you very much. Explain, Julie, a little about how you validate people pitching for a loan, because it's not just somebody randomly filling in a web form, yeah. is it? Yeah. So well, one of the big shifts, we're actually trying to disrupt our own model. Uh, in order to, to, we have two ways. One is through partners, uh, who, who uh, we work with to qualify the borrowers. The other is that um, with the mobile lending and direct, direct lending, we have a self-serve model where people self-qualify. One of the fascinating things we found, which we're very excited about, is that um, when there's a, we have a private fundraising period, so when a borrower comes on and says, I want to take a loan, um, in, in a certain amount of days, they, have to, they reach out to their own community to, on, to uh, appeal to them. And what we found is a high correlation is, is when people get to a certain number of people in their community lending to them, there's a high correlation between that and a high repayment rate. So we're, we're working our way to finding an interesting new underwriting model as a way of qualifying people in a self-serve manner. And the 2% that don't repay, which is a pretty low figure considering <coughs> these are strangers lending to strangers across the world, um, are there any patterns you see in the reasons for them not paying? It's almost always extrinsic circumstances. Uh, you know, the, there was a crop infestation. Um, you know, these are, these are, again, most of them are people living on less than $2 a day. They're micro entrepreneurs. Um, very little room for error in their world. Um, with the Ebola crisis, for example, we've had quite a lot where entire villages are being decimated. We've had quite a lot of, uh, of, of, of people not being able to repay their loans because of circumstances. So, it's uh, it, one of the things to keep in mind is that you have repeat borrowing because it's like none of us ever go to the bank and get a loan once and we're done with it. So this is, they're, they're, in, they're the same uh, as us in terms of uh, repeat borrowing and that incentivizes them to repay because they know that they're building kind of their, their credibility and trust to, to make more, take more loans. So Kiva has proved the model works on a kind of non-profit basis. Are you now starting to see big commercial organizations take your methodology, take your approach, and try and commercialize it? Yes, I mean, I would say that, uh, well, first of all, Kiva, I call Kiva a for revenue, uh, or a not for profit, because we do have a revenue model. We're just not a profit maximization uh, organization. But uh, yes, the, the, uh, I think the one thing that Kiva has uniquely done um, is the global reach. Right, so when you look at other crowdfunding marketplaces, a lot have kind of drawn on. If you look at WOTC, for example, which does health, health loans, um, they're a Silicon Valley-based nonprofit. Um, they have global reach because it's about funding people's kind of healthcare needs. And that's what, so you can find an, invig, an individual who needs an operation and yes. you can choose who to fund. Yes, yes. Uh, but the, most of the time, the crowdfunding marketplaces are much more regional because uh, the global uh, reach is very difficult. That last mile, if you will, very difficult to reach people, you know, six hours from, from uh, you know, Lima in the Peruvian jungle. Well, it's a very inspiring story, but you're also here on presidential business. So explain what your role as the entrepreneurial ambassador is. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a very high level uh, goal um, of essentially helping develop the next generation of, of global entrepreneurs. Uh, so you could say the market is global. And it's based on uh, President Obama's uh, belief that one of the United States' greatest um, exports uh, potentially can be is entrepreneurship. The ecosystem, the culture that we've built around celebrating entrepreneurship is really kind of the, the foundation of what has made the American economy go. So how could we export this to other parts of the world so to help enable the same kind of economic vitality? 
Um, you fundamentally can't have nation stability without economic stability. Uh, how can you make entrepreneurship, uh, that spark of entrepreneurship, become a possible path for youth out there, particularly in countries where you have youth bulge, ma massive populations with no alternatives for employment or economics. And that, that creates disenfranchised populations that are much more vulnerable to being radicalized. So um, this is really kind of some of the, the uh, taking the long view, it's a proactive path to peace, ultimately. Hang out in Europe for a bit. We've got a few issues here. Thank you very much for making the journey. Julie Hanna.